My name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to Insight. Uh, Insight is a show where we normally discuss books on politics, both uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, sometimes we talk about historical books that provide some insight into the present, and sometimes broader trend analysis or atmospheric books that help to put uh, political issues into a broader setting. Uh, today we are talking about a book that more or less addresses domestic politics. Uh, it's uh, called Going to Extremes, How Like Minds Unite and Divide, written by Cass Sunstein, who is a professor at the Harvard Law School. Joining me today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Alexander File. To Alexandra's right is Marina Vela, and to Marina's right is Caro Tunis. So I'd like to read a short uh, quote from the book, and you can get a sense where the author is coming from, and then we'll jump into a discussion about the book. The author writes, much of the time, groups of people end up thinking and doing things that group members would never think or do on their own. When people find themselves in groups of like-minded types, they are especially likely to move to extremes. More precisely, members of a deliberating group usually end up at a more extreme position in the same general direction as their <coughs> inclinations before deliberation began. Political extremism is often a product of group polarization and social segregation is a useful tool for producing polarization. Basically, it's staying the theme of the book that whenever you think of a group of like-minded people coming together, you would think on one topic they would all come together and then meet in the middle. What ends up actually happening, however, is that once an extreme has been placed, people will move more so to it. So if someone comes into something with a prejudice, by the end of the discussion they will have even more prejudice than which they started, or if something has like little to no impact on them, after discussion it will have even less impact on them. Completely agreeing with Alexander, and also I think that being part of the group means like power, so if they are all in the same page, they will have more power, more voice, more force, so they will probably move more to extremes and kind of fight for their rights or for what they are willing to do. So that makes them like being like a strong group. Yeah, also another uh, aspect to um, the group discussion is a lot of new information. So when um, like-minded people come together and uh, discuss a topic, they, they tend to um, talk about information they already know that does not oppose their view. So this way, um, they tend to have stronger uh, values um, in favor of their own position. Yeah, I, uh, I, I understand where some of this is coming from, that, uh, for example, you have this terrible shooting in Las Vegas, and I noticed that um, turning on 97.1, which is sort of a station that is uh, conservative, but in many cases just Republican. Uh, and I noticed that one of the uh, people that does a morning show on there, he immediately had done this now twice when I heard him. He immediately prefaces that the shooter, that ISIS uh, claimed credit. Well, there's, there's no indication that this older white man had some connection to ISIS but he feels the need to preface it, which I suspect uh, has people who are listening to the show and liking constantly what they're hearing, maybe believing that, in fact, uh, this piece of information to them is, like, valid. So as a result, he was a terrorist or is it was a terrorist and he worked with ISIS. And my guess is a number of these people, you're not going to get them to say, no, this nut job probably acted on his own and had no affiliation with anything, but all they're going to hear is this very irresponsible guy on a radio in the morning uh, say something that he knows he's just saying to uh, sort of what his audience would like to hear, but it's no nothing based in reality. It's like a sheep mentality if you think about it. 
if you get a bunch of people together and say one person doesn't know very much about the topic and another person who also doesn't know much about the topic and they come together and they share the same belief, they'll have more conviction that what they believe is actually true rather than just looking it up and seeing if what they think is actually correct. I think they only support like the information that they really goes with the arguments. So they instead of contrasting information and check to like reliable sources, they just go with the things that they support, like they give credit to them that they are true. And the book give one example about the 9-11 attack where a lot of people in the States think that Arabic and Muslim people are, are behind the attack. And if you ask to the Arabic community, they, they don't know, they don't even think that they are behind the attack. And it's because they've received different kind of information and the information they've received is one was more leaning to blame one side and the other one, they don't care. Yeah, I want to go uh, to comment on what you said about knowing little and um, the only thing they do know is um, supporting their own um, extremism. Um, Sunshine actually ref uh, referred to that by um, calling on uh, Russell Hardin with the crippled epistemology. And um, he basically said what, what you also said, that most of extremism do not have all of the information because they're closed off to the opposing sides. And um, the result is that they know very little and the only things they do know support their own um, prejudices. And that's why they keep going towards their own direction. There was um, an experiment that the author conducted with uh, two other people and they did this in uh, Colorado and they took 60 people and then put them into different groups of mm -hmm. six people each and though beforehand as individuals they asked them their opinions on these th uh, three issues. One was do you uh, uh, support the idea of same-sex couples getting married? Uh, do you think that employers should engage in affirmative action programs and should the United States sign an international treaty to combat global warming? So then you have these uh, groups, <coughs> ten groups, six people in each. Some of them are made up of people that have identified themselves as being liberal and some are being conservative and some being more liberal and some mm -hmm. being more conservative and then you asked them beforehand where they stood and, and some of them would have had more moderate views on some of these issues but still might be opposed to say a treaty on global warming or opposed to same-sex marriage but that once they're in the group they moved farther from that more moderate position of saying yeah I don't like uh, same-sex marriage but what the hell it's not affecting me but I still don't like it to no no we're going to outlaw it so you were looking at these uh, movements and they were trying to show how people in groups that as a result the individual sense of individual responsibility to think in some rational way goes out the window. So it basically shows just how important like disagreement and dissent is because whenever someone brings up a topic and one side agrees this but another side disagrees they're able to share information and so what they thought previously was right maybe they hear a good argument from the other side and they go, wow, that's a really solid point, so I have to change my views to go accordingly with it. There's a quote they have on this. They said, the experiment that I just talked about mm -hmm. had a separate effect, one that is equally important. It made both liberal groups and conservative groups significantly hom more homogeneous and thus squelch diversity. Before members started to talk, many groups displayed a fair bit of internal disagreement. So once then they got together, uniformity sort of took over, so to speak, and diversity was out the window. I think it's a reality that people influences other people, and that's what you are talking about when uh, Democrat, Democrats talk to Republicans, they kind of influence themselves, and whenever they got together, Republicans with Republicans, they probably had like different type of thoughts, different thinking, because they've been influenced by Democrats' thinking. Hmm. Yeah, the fact that the groups um, get more homogeneous, um, the result of that is that there is a bigger gap between both the Republicans and the Demo Dem 
Democrats. Um, Democrats. Democrats, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, because both groups have stronger opinions, um, move more to extremism. So if you have a skill from left to right, they move further away from each other. And that's how that gap actually uh, Yeah, a exists. quote here. Uh, when people talk to like-minded others, mm -hmm. they tend to <coughs> amplify their pre-existing views and to do so in a way that reduces their internal diversity. And so again, uh, something I talk about in classes about the notion of its degrees of conservative or degrees of liberal, hence I like to use terms like conservative-ish or liberal-ish rather than the absolutes of liberal and conservative. And when you actually look at people and talk to them on an individual basis, it isn't this absolutism of conservative versus liberal. It's like you have various organizations that rate members of Congress and that in the process of rating them, let's say they might rate somebody as a zero on a conservative scale, so they have no conservative, to a 100 on a conservative scale, so 100% conservative. But if I'm looking at somebody that's 67% conservative or 61% conservative, I'd like to see somebody and said, say, I agree, I am 61% conservative, you know, rather than say, and I'm a good conservative. Well, then tell me you're 61% means well, what what's the rest of you you know so it, it has mm -hmm. more complexity and nuance than what we end up seeing uh, then i and then i think he's rather critical of talk radio shows there because most of them are in a sense being conservative so they're encouraging these people to sort of think as a group and people call in and i agree with you and then they all get very riled up mm -hmm. and a lot of times with uh, false information it basically is highlighting like the problem of like your reputation and how you affect yourself in like social groups is how you're perceived. So like if your group doesn't see it the same way you do, people won't tend to want to say it because they don't want to be perceived as oh I'm the outsider of the group, I'm the outcast. No, they want they'll be like, Yeah, I agree with this. So they perceive to be liked by the group. It's kind of highlighting the problem of like social interaction. People don't want to be seen as like the outsider, or the you know the outcast. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that it's easier to be like one one more of the member of the group, one more member of the group, instead of being like the one who thinks different, the one the diverse man, the the one the one that steps up and say I'm not agree with you or I think just different is like in the comfort zone being a member of the group mm -hmm. and just go along with what the other says. Yeah, um, it's basically also depends on um, the social status because if you're a lower, lower social status in a group you um, tend to hold your opinion to yourself if, if it's opposing to the, um, to the major few and um, that's actually pretty dangerous because like Sunshine also, also said is that members of the group underestimate the power um, and performance of the low status members and the performance of the high status members are overestimated. So that's how s way stronger um, souls and stronger people higher in the society get more to say than the uh, low society members. They were uh, talking about uh, federal judges as an example and they said we're going to look at the federal court of appeals and so that uh, you would have three judges on a panel mm -hmm. doing a ruling he says so let's take a look at a situation where the panel is consisting of three republican appointees and three or three democratic appointees or maybe you're going to have two of one party and one of the other one way or two of them leading the other way so you might have two democrat and one republican or two republican one democrat and so what they were saying was they noticed that uh, three democrats on the panel tended to have opinions that were more uh, towards one extreme and same thing with three Republicans, they were more extreme, whereas when you had it more the mix of Democrat and Republicans, their opinions tend to be more moderate. So that they were trying to show that it wasn't just related to groups and how they think, but you're having sort of a judge polarization. And that was a sort of a term they were coming up with, that judges can be polarized depending on how they issue these opinions. 
And that's what I think when probably variety, variety of people like mixing um, some thoughts, some kind of um, critical thinking makes kind of a more moderate um, thinking. Like if you mix different two different times, you will have something not extreme, just more equal in the middle. And maybe is that the solution to mix things, to have a moderate solution and standard result instead of a two extremes. Yeah, it actually surprised me what uh, Sunshine wrote about judges because we all think that judges are supposed to be non-partial. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of shocked me that when once they are on a panel with three of the same political preference that um, also judges, just like normal individuals, uh, tend to move to extremes. Um, and yeah, they were looking at this regarding uh, gay rights. So they looked at a whole series of gay rights cases, and if you had mm -hmm. three Republicans, the three Republicans uh, together, more likely you were going to see a higher uh, rejection of gay rights. But if you had one Democrat and two Republicans, now there was some support for gay rights. And if you had one Republican and two Democrats, there was more support. And then, if you had two Democrats and one, so what you're doing is going in a situation where you were looking at a way of trying to almost measure um, how these outcomes uh, came about in a, a legal sense. Everyone has an inclination whenever there's a topic of which way they will lean. And when you have other people who lean the same way that you do, you'll tend to go farther and farther that way. And that was basically the whole point of what this was trying to discuss. Hmm. What I was talking about, um, before, like, I think the middle opinions are better than ex extreme opinions, but when they get together, like, people from the same uh, type of thinking, they tend to go to the extreme, and that's why extremes are not good, um, from, my, from my point of view, um, if they are kind of radical, because they can act in s without like contemplating the other side of the opinion. Hmm. I do not fully dis uh, agree with you because um, Martin Luther, Luther King, for example, is also a, an extremism, extremist. And um, it doesn't necessarily have, mm -hmm. has to be bad, but um, the problem here is that people are uh, isolated because they do not hear the point of view from other sides. and with um, cases like Martin Luther King, he had enough knowledge to um, make the choice to go to extremes. So I think that's a different there. What different sort there. of extremism would you see in him? Um, what do you mean with that? Well, issue? you said he was extreme, so just curious what Martin Luther King would be extremism. He's extreme um, in the sense that he uh, rallied people to come together and to rally against a, a, against a normal um, view. Okay, the view at that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, they were talking interestingly here about jury awards and that one jury might award over a million dollars and another a hundred thousand and why and they were realizing that jury members bring a degree of outrage and if your jury members have a higher degree of outrage, they're more likely to award more as they have a lower level of outrage, they're maybe mm -hmm. going to award less. So you can look at degrees of punishing wrongdoing, so to speak. Yeah, that was also discussed in the book about like a University of Chicago law students, they had a case where people were not outraged on a case and the people who were outraged on a case, and for some odd reason, no one really knows, but there is like a radical advantage for whenever people are outraged as opposed to when they are not outraged. I think it's because people have an emotional investment whenever someone is outraged, so they want to punish them the best they can. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that happen when you are a part of a group like like-minded in one extreme, like you don't even listen to the other part, and you don't even. Um, support even they have like the same the same facts the same the same arguments the same data because you are against that the other part so you will never give a chance to them to 
to maybe explain or to agree with them because you are completely against them? Yeah, what struck me is that um, the two, there were three central concerns and uh, first to the degree of outrage and the desired level of punishment. Um, all the judges were fairly on the same page with that. But the amount of money that should be awarded to the victim, that was um, a sketchy one because um, <clears throat> the dollar scale was really hard to, um, to judge. They were looking at a case here of an escalator stopping suddenly and a woman uh, <coughs> fell down and hurt herself so now she had a lawsuit and that uh, depending on how outraged or not outraged you were, some people will go it's just part of a normal accident, no big deal, and others will know this is an example of corporate wrongdoing. Now you were being torn in which direction, and it would have an impact on uh, how you were looking at what you wanted to award in a jury or not award because, and so they were trying to show how your values on this stuff, and as a result, you were fighting within this group over this. Basically, what they're trying to go back to the point of is when you have an emotional investment in something, especially when you are angry, you tend to not really want to think, oh, I shouldn't be angry about this. I am angry about this, and I have reasons for it. But when people are like not as angry about it, they're more clear-headed, so they're able to see the whole picture and be like, this is what's wrong with it, and this is what's right with it. Here we can make a decision. So I think emotions do play a fact in, you know. Yes, and along what we, you are saying, uh, <coughs> when they are maybe clear, they can st start deliberating and talking to the other part, and that's why it makes those two extremes mm -hmm. in common. I had a, qu a question here. What happens when people who are inclined to take risks talk with other people who are inclined to <coughs> take risks, and so they become more risky? Mm -hmm. And so as a result, any cautious thinking sort of goes out the window and so as a result you're willing to take even greater levels of risk than you would as an individual. And so once again you, you're seeing a movement of how groups act as opposed to say thinking along the level of being an individual. Uh, I thought there was another interesting little thing when you asked individuals what they thought of their boss they, many of them had a higher opinion of a boss as an individual, but if you got them all together in a room and asked them as a collective group, they were more <coughs> likely to say nasty things against the boss. So you <laughs> saw again the difference between sort of a group and an individual. Well, whenever you're like an individual, like you don't really know what happens to everybody else. It's like, oh, well this is one time he messed with me, but whenever you get a room with people, and everyone starts listening like their problems are like wow there's a lot of problems here that I didn't know about so like new information and they make a new judgment yeah and people uh, get more powerful when they're with the group so they don't they don't are, they are not afraid to say like what they really think because they have people who support them when you are alone you are probably <coughs> just gonna save your spot and say like good things because you don't wanna lose your job <coughs> or or you don't want to see the truth because you don't have the support behind you. Yeah, they tend to be more cautious. The, uh, the book went on to uh, discuss about uh, how the movement of a group happens and they were talking about the introduction of new information. Now, new information doesn't have to be accurate or real, mm -hmm. just new information. You uh, talk about it in terms of uh, certain uh, say elections where you say the other side's trying to steal the election. There's no indication what they're saying is actually true, but what you end up doing is see a situation where as long as people in that group believe it, that's good enough. And so it's, it's a way they start to look at uh, disinformation or misinformation. Uh, and so what you're doing is, well, Trump may like to use the words uh, fake news. In many cases, it's people that support him that are willing to believe incredible quantities of completely fake news, uh, but it allows them to sort of have sort of this feeling of we're a group and why we can have extreme views. Yeah, so it was interesting how Sun Sen was talking about an experiment that um, a couple of people in a group know, knew the truth. And um, when they were discussing it with other people, it was striking that still sometimes the truth would not come out because the majority of the people believed otherwise. 
So that's that's kind of a proof how the majority's judgment judgment is really important in uh, group discussions. We only have a few minutes left, so let's go around the table. And uh, you recommend this book, and if so, why, and uh, what do you think of it? I would recommend the book mainly because it discusses like issues of you need to have dissent and arguing and able to be informed. And if you're not informed, you're most likely able to make the wrong decision. And it also states that just because something is radical, like she said with Martin Luther King, doesn't mean it's wrong. Because just because Martin Luther Th King thought that everyone should have free rights doesn't mean what he was was wrong. But, for example, terrorist attacks, they are considered wrong, and you should avoid them. So. I totally recommend this book to people who have like, strong opinions and people who believe that um, there's no one right answer in politics. There's like two kind of groups and extremes and people is not sometimes in the fence. They kind of decide what they want and they have an opinion. And also um, like if they want the book, it's been easy because they have um, so provide a lot of examples, a lot of experiments to help to being focused on, on the book and don't get lost in the reading and I would definitely recommend the book. I agree with Marina that um, this book shows that there's always two sides of a problem and um, he uses very clear and precise language on uh, explaining all the experiments. So it, I would definitely recommend it, especially to political science students. Um, what's also very important in this book is that he kind of shows the dark side of um, the freedom of thought and speech and that's a really uh, good thing to really think about. Uh, yeah, I like the book. I think it gives you some insight into how to stop to think like an individual and not be persuaded that you suddenly hear groups. And I guess that is my concern with sort of talk radio that tends to be conservative is we as a group, look at us, we're together, we're against them, look at those libs over there, those lefties over, you know, and then immediately you sort of think, wait a minute, let me try and think for myself, I don't need this sort of us versus them extremism. And so he's simply trying to show you that, and he's not trying to make you shift extreme positions from one, say, side direction to the other. He's trying to show you how not to go to extremes of that version. How do you sort of think in some way within a middle ground of how you're looking at something? And I think he presented it well in a way that it's fairly easy to get through the book. It's not a long read. So um, good book. Thank you for joining us today.